let me begin by telling you various representations that you can have for your data, starting with things that you know, things sort of like wavelets, and then moving on to a different perspective that might seem really quite unusual. But hopefully, these will be techniques that during your PhD, you'll run into how do I represent data, how do I work with data in a mathematical modeling kind of way, and then these will be useful things for you to know. So we're going to look at, throughout my lecture, uh, representations using notions from Fourier analysis. So these are things like what I was describing that goes under the heading of applied and computational harmonic analysis. And then we're going to start to go into things that are a bit more modern. We're going to start talking about how we can start doing learning. We want to come up with representations for the data that are data dependent in some way. Okay. That'll bring us to things like sparse approximation, basis pursuit, compressed sensing, dictionary learning. And then we're going to take what in a normal university would be quite a dramatic change. We're going to start talking about a thing from numerical linear algebra called the synchronous value decomposition. But this is really one of the workhorses in data science. It's probably one of the, the very most used techniques in data science. And I'll tell you a view on, on the synchronous value decomposition, which sort of follows from the discussion here about learning representations for your data. We'll view this as, again, learning a representation. And then we'll talk about some new extensions of how you might calculate a synchronous value decomposition, what you might use it for, and how you could use this in settings that might be more complicated than you might imagine, like the realities of data science, where you rarely have all of the data. If you do have all of the data, it's rarely complete. There might be corruption in the data. Some of it might even be pathological. And we'll talk about how you can use notions from the singular value decomposition even in those more complicated settings. And they go by names such as low rank approximation or matrix completion. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. Here's the slide that everyone probably knows, which is Fourier series. And then we're going to move on quite quickly. So Fourier series, you've probably all had at some point. We know that you can take a function this is my one slide where we deal with functions as a continuous variable. From now on, after this, we're going to go to discrete. So we have a continuous function given by some weights of some representations. And here the representations are these complex exponentials, e to the i, k, x, with some weights. And those weights are given by some formula. Okay, so now we have a representation. We could represent our data using these functions, e to the i, k, x, over k in z, k being the integers. We could do discrete variance if we were to truncate, which is more typical in data science. Typically, you don't have functions. You have discrete data. Typically, it comes to you that way. Not always, but typically. And here's exactly the analog. Here, all we're doing is we're taking x and we're replacing it by a finite set of points. So x is going to be given by some point. Think of it as x sub l, where we take x and we replace it by 2 pi l over n. And we just look at samples as we go along, just discrete points. And then we replace our integral for how we calculate the Fourier coefficients to be a sum. Okay, now why is this useful? Well, we all know why it's useful. You can take functions that might seem fairly complicated. Here's some function who in its dual representation in Fourier space is actually extremely simple. So in Fourier space, this function is simply composed of four spikes. Okay? There's just four frequencies that are being used. That means there's four values of f hat of k, or sorry, f tilde of k, which are non-zero. The rest of them are all zero. So if you have the choice of thinking about this function in this space or in this space, you can see much more about this function by looking at it in the Fourier space. So this gives you a reason why representations for the data are helpful. Okay. There are a number of things you can talk about in Fourier series. Things such as preservation of energy. If you look at the sum of the square of the entries in one space, it's proportional to the sum of the square of the entries in the other space. Okay, good. Now, the disadvantage of Fourier series is that it's a very global operation. We looked at the function over the entire interval. And generally in data science, we're interested in uncovering features of the data that's more localized in some way. Here's an example of how one might do this. So you could say, I want to look at a function f of x locally, 
and I want to do a local Fourier analysis. Well, how might I do that? One option would be I just multiply it by a characteristic function, which would be, say, zero everywhere except in some small interval, and then I do the Fourier series. That would just be doing exactly what we did before on a little piece of an interval. You could repeat that. That's not so clever. You could instead use a function which is smooth. There are many reasons why that would be advantageous. We're not going to go into them, but that is what one would tend to do in practice. You would use some function such as a Gaussian, and you would multiply your function f by this g, this local bump function, and you would do your Fourier analysis there. Okay? Fine. So you would simply be computing Fourier coefficients by multiplying by g, maybe shifted at different points. Okay? So you shift it by a each time to look at different pieces of the function, and for each of those Fourier analysis, you get some understanding of the function. Once you put a spacing on a, you're taking steps in a in the physical space, you could also take steps in the Fourier space. You wouldn't have to just step by integers, you could step by integers times b. Okay? So you can think of this as putting down a two-dimensional grid. One dimension is time, which is what we had before for our signal. The other one is now frequency. Before we were thinking of the time as being just an interval, and the frequency as being integers. One, two, three, four. Now, we're going to put down a grid which is going to have a time spacing of a, so that we get our localization. Every step of a, we're going to look at what's happening in the function. And in the frequency space, we're going to take steps of size b. Okay. This is a way of doing analysis. This is called either the short time Fourier transform or the Gabor transform, depending on some of the details. Now, you might wonder, okay, I have such a representation. Is this as easy as the Fourier representation? And the answer is no. There's a lot of complications that would come into play here. So, for example, if a and b are small enough numbers, so if a is, say, the integers, 1, 2, 3, and b is the integers, 1, 2, 3, then you might think that this would be like the Fourier case, and it almost is like the Fourier case. It is like the Fourier case, provided you use a function which is just uh, 1 between a half and 1, minus a half, sorry, minus a half and a half. But if you use something like the Gaussian, it's more complicated than that. It turns out what you would need for this to work well is you would need a times b to be greater than 1. Then you would have enough information from these coefficients that you took by taking the inner product between these test functions, these shifted Gaussians, against your function, that you, from those coefficients, from these things, you would be able to recover the original function. If you have a times b being, uh, sorry, being less than 1, that's what you need for recovery, if it's greater than 1, then your spacing is too big, you've made too big of holes in this two-dimensional partitioning of the domain, and you simply will not be able to recover the function. And then there's a lot of complicated issue that happens about what happens when a times b is equal to 1. We're not going to go into that kind of detail, but this is to give you a feel for how you would take Fourier analysis and you would localize it, and the kinds of issues that would arise. So for example, in this simple case, gamma would not be unique if a times b was too large. Sorry, this should say large. But if it's small enough, then it would be unique, the gamma. You could come up with a nice representation. Well, at least you have the canonical duals, what's called, and this is how you would come up with your representation. To make this more concrete, let me give you some pictures. We're going to focus on pictures rather than theorems. So here's some pictures. This comes from some work of Thomas Stromer. Here's a one-dimensional signal. Okay, fine. If you were to take its Fourier series, this is the kind of thing that you would get. Okay. How would you interpret that? Well, based upon what we were talking about with Fourier series before, you would say, well, look, there's a very large coefficient here, maybe two. I think that that's essentially the way I would represent the data. And the rest of this is sort of small. Well, it's not so small, actually. So should I just disregard that and say, well, it's essentially here? Hmm, it's complicated. And the reason it's complicated isn't that this function is so complicated, but that this function is not as simple as a few frequencies. It's like a few frequencies at any given time, but varying. The frequencies vary. So imagine we played this game that we had before, called the Gabor transform, or short time Fourier transform, where we multiplied it by a Gaussian. Well, what Gaussian? We could choose e to the minus x squared, or we could put a weight in the exponent to make the Gaussian either narrow or wide. What if we made it wide? 
Well, then this is what we would get for the magnitude of those coefficients f hat j k in the two-dimensional space. And what you would see is, well, there is a particular frequency, this frequency right here, that is essentially active throughout the whole domain. But there is some other frequency information that's active starting around here that is increasing, and that's why you can see some greater oscillations here. So at this time, yes, it's about one frequency, but over here it's really not. It's really more like two frequencies. Okay, so it's not so complicated. You just have to focus your attention on the function locally. Now, if you were to take a function which is extremely narrow, you would blur things out horizontally. So this line, which was very nice and sharp, so this particular frequency across the domain becomes very, very wide and very broad. You don't have good resolution all of those <coughs> particular frequency components. But you do see some particular spike here that says, ah, something interesting happened in the function here. It's not so well behaved. Maybe it's not even smooth. Okay. Or you could try some compromise between these two, and you could have something which was sort of a medium width. Now this gives you a sense that from Fourier series, you could go to these kinds of Gabor or, four, or short time Fourier transforms. You now have a parameter in your function, g, or you could use other functions, g, and you could look at different parameters and different ways of understanding the data. Okay. Now that leads to some questions. First of all, well, how do I choose g? How do I choose these parameters, right? Here you could think, well, I like the wide one, but here I like the narrow one. Maybe I should use both in some way. So we could start to talk about learning how you would choose those particular values. And you'd like to do it in a way which is data dependent, rather than manually sitting there and varying some parameter on your window until things look qualitatively to your eye in a way that you're happy. We're going to go to that in just a moment. But we're also going to move from here on, and I'm going to show you very briefly, uh, wavelets. Wavelets, I'm going to do wavelets in one slide. Wavelets are very similar to the Gabor transform and the short time Fourier transform, but they partition the time frequency plane in a different way. Instead of it being a, a simply steps by A in one space and steps by B in the other space, they do some dyadic splits. So the steps in one space become narrower as you move up in frequency. It's a little complicated. You don't need to know about the details. But it's interesting to see some examples. So uh, for those of you who are up in Edinburgh, this is, what is this, Ben? The theater. OK. So this is the theater. And here are the wavelet coefficients, the magnitude of the wavelet coefficients of the theater. And what you can see is essentially a version of the theater, which is much smaller. This is essentially an averaging of the image that we started with. You could keep this process going until that was really small, but I stopped it partway through. And then you see other things. So what do you see here? Well, you see something which is approximately like a first derivative, horizontally. And here, approximately a first derivative vertically. And then you have diagonal components. So this corresponds to diagonal differences, essentially. And then the same thing here again. So this one is the full size, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal. And you can see things like these posts appearing here horizontally, but not at all vertically, or very, very small in the vertical space. So here's a few representations from the Fourier analysis point of view. We had Fourier, we had Gabor, we had wavelets. OK, now let's start talking about how you might make sense of having so many representations. You might start learning what representation you would like to use. Well, the way you would want to measure the success of your representation would be to ask how well you can approximate your data with that representation. So now I'm going to take a bit of a linear algebra notation for this. Imagine we have data, which is y. So it's a vector. We want to represent this vector. How do we represent it? Well, we represent it with other vectors of the same length. Those would correspond to your Fourier coefficients, or your Fourier, your Fourier uh, representations over the domain, or Gabor wavelets, or wavelets, there would be particular columns that you would use to represent y. And the weights, the f hat, or the f tilde of k, or the uh, f tilde of j of k, would correspond to weights, those would be your values in x, 
that pre-multiplied the columns in A, which are your representations, to give you and synthesize the Y that you're interested in. So take this mindset of this linear algebra problem. Y is the data. The columns of A are representations that someone told you about, such as Fourier series or wavelets. And the X is simply giving you the coefficients in this other space for that representation on how to represent Y. Okay, well, how are you going to represent Y using not all coefficients in X? Well, you're gonna keep the ones that are dominant. You're gonna keep the largest ones, and that's referred to as hard thresholding. You simply keep the K largest entries, and you refer to that as a, a K term approximation. So we will approximate Y using K columns of A by setting all the K entries in X to zero. That way we only pre-multiply K columns by non-zero values, and Y would be approximated by the sum of some columns of A, K different columns of A, with the weights being whatever they were from hard threshold and keeping the largest entries in X. Well, if our representation A, A is our representation for the data, if it is a representation such that we can approximate Y very well in terms of the size of the energy of Y using few coefficients, then this would be a successful representation for us. Okay, fine. So this is just saying the relative error using K terms in this representation A for Y would be small. And how does this work in practice? Well, it depends on the representation that you choose, but generically, you would be able to choose a representation such that if your data is well-behaved, it isn't noisy, such as in the Fourier case, it's smooth, things are nice, then you would find that as you increase K, the size of this would decay proportional to K to some power, with P being something like two or three, or in some cases, if Y is really well behaved, though it's rarely that well behaved in practice in data science, then P could be very, very large, 10 or 100. So this is the way the one talks about compressing data, compressing Y. So this is something that we do essentially all the time in data science. And the choice of the representation, the choice of A, is going to tell us how successful we are. And we gave some examples of how to do that. But as I mentioned, we don't really know which representation to choose unless you become an expert on a particular domain and you say, ah, for this kind of problem, this is the representation you want to use, and that's the A. And there are people who do that, but in data science, a more common thing that we're doing is rather than choosing a specific representation, we use multiple good ideas and we choose from the best. Or maybe we even learn our own representation. We're going to go through that process in the next few slides. So for example, you could say, I would like to use something like Fourier, but there might be some localized features. So I would also take one wavelet basis and I would put those together. I would form as my matrix, the matrix that came from Fourier series and the matrix that came from a wavelet representation. I would glue them together and I would try to find the best representation from those two. That's referred to as basis pursuit. So here's what you do. You have some A, the A may have many, many, many more columns than the length of the vector. So you have many possible representations that you could choose from, from A to represent Y. And you constrain the problem by saying, well, look, I'm only gonna choose K columns from A. Maybe you give me more and more columns to choose from, but I fix the budget of how many columns I could use. Okay, so I want to choose the fewest number of entries in X that are going to be non-zero, subject to some quality of fit. Okay, fine. Now, how would we understand such a problem? This could be difficult. Let's talk about the simple examples of this problem. So a simple case would be, well, let's wonder how different the columns of A are. If the columns were almost identical, you could imagine that it might be very difficult to choose between the two. If they're very different, in fact, if they're orthogonal, if their inner product with each other is zero, then it would be very easy to tell one from the other. So let's think about what that would mean in terms of a reconstruction. So here's a notion called coherence, which just measures the maximum inner product between any two columns of A, okay? So if your A was an orthogonal system, like, and even further, we fix the length of A 
So the inner product between any two columns is 1. Then this would correspond to having mu be 0. And the solution to choosing the best k-term approximation is trivial. You simply apply the transpose of A. So you take the inner product between every column in A and Y. Those are the possible entries in X. You keep the k largest entries, and you're done. Okay. So there's nothing complicated in that example. That's just simply solving a linear algebra problem that's extremely easy. On the other hand, if the number of columns that you have to choose from is larger than the length of the vector, which would typically be the case, you would have more options than it would be obvious how you would choose the selection, you might try to nonetheless still be able to find the optimal solution. And this could be very difficult. In fact, there are theorems that would tell you how difficult it is, and we'll talk about a little bit of that. So you might wonder, how small could this be? Well, there's interesting results about such things. So it turns out that it's proportional to 1 over the square root of m. So as you make problems that are larger and larger and larger, the columns can look more and more orthogonal. So there's benefits that you gain by looking at problems of very large size. They behave, or can behave, more and more alike being an orthonormal system. This is an interesting point of view. Okay, so how could we go about finding the largest entry? So this is a technique that in the signal processing literature would go up by the term match filtering. What it's simply saying is, I have y, I want to try to represent y, I have a, the columns of a are possible things that I could use to represent y. How am I going to decide which columns of a to use? Well, Assuming that the columns of A are all weighted the same, so they're all of the same length, you don't choose some that are long and some that are short, but they're all of the same length, then you could simply look at the inner product between a column of A, so this is going to give you the vector of all of the inner products between the columns of A, between the inner product between a column of A and Y, and ask how large it is. If it's very large, then Y looks a lot like that column. Good. And then you should choose it. You should use that in your representation. If it's very small, it doesn't really represent your signal, and you shouldn't choose it. So this would look almost like what we said before. Before, remember, we said that the optimal solution in the case of a square system was simply to apply a transpose times y and take the largest entries. Here we're saying to do exactly the same thing. But now m is greater than n. We have an underdetermined system of equations. Nonetheless, we're still going to be able to do the recovery, but we're going to, once we've identified which columns of A, lambda is going to be a set of indices, we're going to choose which columns. So if the seventh column of A looks a lot like Y, so that this inner product was very large for the seventh entry, then lambda would be a set that would include seven. Fine. Okay. So how do we prove that this kind of thing works? So this is our one bit of math that we're going to do. We're going to have a proof as a mathematician. I thought we should do so, and this one is easy enough. So here's a theorem. If y can be exactly represented using k columns, where k, this is the number of columns, is less than some complicated expression, okay, don't worry so much about what this is, but provided the number of non-zeros in x is small enough, then this will give you exactly the optimal answer. And it's not complicated at all. You just applied A transpose, you kept the largest entries, and you're done. Okay, so how can we see whether that's going to work or not? Well, the proof is pretty straightforward. It's as you would imagine. What you do is you ask, if I were to take a column of A that corresponds to one of the places where x naught is non-zero, how large is the inner product between that column and y? Let's make sure it's not too small. And then let's take the columns of A, which correspond to where you have zeros in x naught. <coughs> let's look at how much those columns look like y. Let's make sure that that is not too large. If it's always largest on the places where x naught is non-zero, then by taking the ones that are non-zero, we've identified the correct support. Once we have identified the correct support, then this is the solution, this is simply the least square solution, this is telling you what the values ought to be, and this is trivial, this is easy to understand why this is the case. If you don't know, I can tell you later. So let's see the proof. 
Okay. So we're going to come up with a vector, which is simply a transpose y. Okay. What are the entries in that vector? Well, if y is given by a x naught, for some x naught, then I can simply plug that in for y. And then if we want to know what is the ith entry of w, well, that's simply given by this expression. It's simply taking this and multiplying by the ith column in A, the transpose of the ith column in A. So that's what this is. But when I look at that inner product between the ith column of A and what is here, I know that this only includes some columns of A. It only includes the columns of A for which x0 is non-zero. So I'm going to refer to the set of where x0 is non-zero as the support set of x0. So you tell me where it's non-zero, call that soup of x0, and I'm just going to look at the inner product between my test vector, ai, and these different aj's for j in the support set. Fine. Okay, that's the ith entry, and what I want to know is when i is in the support set, or not in the support set of x0, how does it behave? So if i is not in the support set, then I want to make sure that the entry is not too large. How do I see that? Well, I'm going to simply do triangle inequality. So I simply put an absolute value around this, put an absolute value here, pass the absolute value inside, so I have an absolute value on that and on that, and then I note that this entry can never be larger than its largest entry. I'm going to denote that by this thing. It's called the infinity norm of x0. So for mathematicians, we refer to it as norms, which are lengths of vectors. This is simply the largest entry in x0. And then this is that coherence quantity we talked about before. It's the inner product between two entries. Okay? So I take the largest that that thing could ever be, I put that here, now if I factor this out, and I factor that out, there's nothing left inside except, say, 1, and there's k entries in the support set, so I get k. k times the coherence in A, and the largest entry in x0. Okay, so if I were looking at an entry in I that I, in, in W, the ith entry in W, which I hope I don't actually select, I know it's not going to be larger than this. Well, what if I'm choosing an entry that I do want to select? How do we make sure it doesn't get too small? Well, it's almost the same thing. I simply do the reverse triangle inequality. So I take out the largest, I put absolute values here, absolute values there, and then I break this up into just two entries. The largest entry, I separate that out because it's special, and the rest I leave together. So I take the largest entry here in x0. Why do I take the largest entry out? Well, because for that entry, you have a i a j for j being i. So it's the same value. And then the coherence is actually one rather than what we hope, which is that it's small, right? So I take that one out and then for the rest of them, I take minus the sum of the absolute value of all those entries. I pass the absolute value inside and I do the same thing as I did before. I take out the largest entry here. I look at the coherence and then this sum, one of the entries has been pulled out so I don't have k of them, I have k minus one of them, okay? Well, where did that theorem come from on the prior slide? Well, I simply make sure that the maximum entry here, the maximum of the entries that I don't want, is less than the minimum entry here. And the minimum entry here is no more than this, so if this is less than this, and you solve for k, that tells you how large k can be in order to guarantee that you get recovery. So you now have a mathematical proof that's going to be the end of our mathematical proofs for my lecture. Maybe Gazine and Ben will, will give us more detail. So, that's a very simple algorithm, and you might think, well, maybe this is a simple problem. It turns out this is not a simple problem. There's many algorithms, and how you actually understand them is quite complicated. I wanted to give you one more example, just so you have a sense of this. Here's an example of a slightly more complicated version, although this is still a very simple example. So, you could say, I'm going to come up with where I believe the non-zeros are, and I'm going to do it like before, but whereas before I took the inner product between y and columns in A, and I took the largest ones, here I'm going to take them one at a time. I'm going to choose one column in A that I really, really think is the right column, 
and then I'm going to remove it. I'm going to choose the next column that I really think is the right one and remove it. And I'm going to keep doing that until I have a good enough representation for y. So I start with a set, which is the index set of which columns I'm going to choose, and it's empty. I start off with my vector being all zero, the x vector, and I start off with my residual being, well, if this is just zero, it's just y. So my first step looks just like before. I look at the maximum inner product. Mathematicians call this R <coughs> So the index j, sorry, the index l, which maximizes the inner product between a particular column and the residual at the jth iteration. So in the first iteration, this is simply, i is simply the index for the column that has the greatest inner product with y. Okay, fine. And then what I say is, I really think that i is a column that I should use in my representation. So my set, lambda that I had before, I add an entry to it, I give it an index, I give it an index i. Okay, fine. So now I have a column that I'm going to use in my representation. I then choose what the value of that non-zero in x should be. It's the same formula as we had before. Okay, fine. And I make sure that x is zero everywhere else. Okay. And then I repeat this process, having removed that particular choice for the weight in this is called orthogonal matching pursuit. It's the same thing as before, except you choose the best one at every step. That means this is much, much slower, right? You can imagine, first you compare all the columns, and then you compare all but one of the columns, and all but two of the columns, and of course that's much more costly than just comparing all the columns once and choosing the best ones. The result is a little bit better. So there was a funny uh, new value, if you recall, that was the ratio of the smallest non-zero in x compared to the largest non-zero, which told you that before, if you had a really small value in x, it would be very hard to find. But here, it turns out, it doesn't depend, your success, on x at all. It only depends on the inner product between the columns in x. Or at least, this is a condition which will guarantee recovery that is independent of x. We're not going to go through the proof of that, but it gives you a sense that you could do this. So we now have a technique, or a couple of techniques, by which we could take a set of representations for our data that some expert came along and said, use these representations for your data, and we could choose the best subset of those for a particular piece of data, y, that we were given. Does that make sense? Okay. So, is this, is this result that we have uh, particularly compelling? Well, the answer is not really. You might ask, how, how big is this? How many non-zeros in x naught can we have that we guarantee we get recovery? And the answer is, well, based upon what I talked about, the coherence, it turns out, it can't be too small. If you have n being greater than m, and they're both large and proportional, so n is like 5 times m, so you say, here's 5 different square representations, 5 different bases, and I plug them together, so n is 5 times m, and I look at very large instances of such a problem, well then, this coherence is going to be proportional to 1 over the square root of m. It won't be any smaller than that. Okay, so what does that mean? If you plug this value in here, well, this is just the inverse of that, and you don't really care about this plus one, or the half, is proportional to the square root of m. So you have a vector, you have some data, which has m entries in it, and I can tell you, if you give me some examples of how you might want to represent that data, you can, presuming they're not too similar, those representations, you can find the optimal representation but only using approximately the square root as many coefficients from that representation. Well, if you have a vector of length 10 to the 6, you're talking about using only 10 to the 3 coefficients in your approximation, and for a lot of problems, that simply wouldn't be enough to give a good enough representation that you would be happy. So, this isn't enough to get us where we'd like to go in general, and if we want to get better results, we can get better results, but then it's going to get complicated,
And we're not going to go into it, but I thought it was worth mentioning that like in a lot of problems these days in data science, the way that you get around this is you introduce randomness. So you take the problem and you add some randomness in such a way that you can't have pathological examples that cause you problems. There are pathological examples that do cause problems that tell you that if it's simply all you know is something about the coherence, then you can't really do any better than this. But if you change the problem just a little bit, make it a little bit randomized, then you'll never run into those problems. There's theorems about this kind of thing, random matrix theory, and you could say, well, let's say for example, if the columns of A were random, chosen random from a Gaussian representation, Gaussian distribution, then I would be able to get recovery where this is actually going to be proportional to M, not proportional to the square root of M. So you would say something like, I'll use a tenth of the length of the vector coefficients in my new space. So this could be size of, say, M over 10, which is the kind of thing you talk about in compression. It's not as small as the square root, but like a tenth or a fifth of the coefficients, something like that, is more typical in actual applications. Okay, so we're going to briefly talk about a couple of other things where we transition now to really learning much more than we did before. So we started with some classical representations, Fourier, Gabor, Wavelets. We then went to sparse approximation where we said, okay, if you had more representations, we could learn which of those are the best ones. But here, we're going to go a step further, and we're going to assume you have no idea what is a sensible representation at all, and you're going to come up with a representation. You're going to come up with a representation by learning it from the data. This is called dictionary learning. So here's an example of how you might do that. So let's say someone comes along and they give you lots of examples of the kinds of data that you're interested in. So these might be uh, musical scores, they might be images, they might be something else, something that you can represent as a vector. And you have n instances of this data. Okay? Now, if n was one, if someone gave you one, only one example, you couldn't really learn a representation for it. You would say the best way to represent it is by itself. But if someone gave you lots and lots and lots of examples and said, I want a representation which doesn't use very many possible examples that would still work for this very broad class of data. If n were very large, how would I come up with such a representation? Well, here's essentially the way you formulate the problem. You have some matrix D, that's going to take the place of A beforehand. This is your dictionary. You're going to learn this dictionary. You're gonna have another matrix, X. X is going to be a bit peculiar. X is going to have columns, none of which have more than k non-zeros. Okay. Well, what is that saying? What it's saying is if I took y, my column, my, these yi's, and I formed them into some matrix y, capital Y, I'm saying that I'm going to represent a particular piece of data, yi, using d and a particular column of d, uh, sorry, a particular uh, the ith column in x, which uses the support of the columns in, in x i, those k non-zeros, it uses that set of k columns in d to represent y i. And I constrained the size of the number of representations, so p being less than the minimum of these. Now, this is a very complicated problem. I'm going to learn two matrices to fit this other matrix. But this is entirely data dependent. Now, how might you start such an algorithm? Well, typically you could start by choosing D to be something that you thought of as a sensible choice, and then you just learn things. Now, algorithmically, how do you actually solve this? Well, what you do is you hold D fixed, and then you go, and for each column of Y, you learn what the proper XI should be by solving these problems we talked about before. It's exactly one of these problems from before. It's a sparse approximation problem. Tell me the x that has no more than k non-zeros that I should use to select columns from d to represent y. And after I've done that, I hold x fixed and I solve for d. Okay. 
And there's various ways you choose D, and there's various ways in which you solve this problem, and that gives you a variety of different dictionary learning algorithms, but that's essentially what they all come down to. Okay, so this is a, a step where we've gone all the way to fully learning the representation D. Okay, interesting. Now we're going to take a very different change. So this might not look like it's in all those same kind of problems, but let me give you a reason to think of the singular value decomposition as doing something like dictionary learning, but it's not from multiple examples, it's from an example. Okay, so here's the way we would normally think of it in mathematics. Someone comes along and they give you a matrix. Okay? So I'm not talking about vectors anymore, I'm talking about a matrix. Someone gives you a matrix, and I tell you, I can take the matrix, any matrix you give me, it can even be rectangular, and I can do something which is like an eigenvalue decomposition, called the singular value decomposition. I can decompose it into the product of three matrices, might seem like it was harder than before, but it's easier than dictionary learning. U, sigma, and V, star, where U is a square matrix, V is a square matrix, so that other size, and sigma is a diagonal matrix where the values on the diagonal are non-increasing. Think of them as decreasing. Decreasing positive values. Okay, fine. So, well, as a side note, if these are distinct, then the U's and the V's are unique. So let's imagine we're in that simple case, which is typical in a data science problem. You don't typically have the same exact value of the sigma up here. Then, and let's say that at some point, they start being zero. After a while, they're all equal to zero. There's only R values of sigma that are non-zero. Then what are we actually saying that we have? We're saying that we can represent A in this representation. What is this representation? Well, it's R, different things, and those things are a simple value, a scalar number, sigma i, a weight, times this thing, u i v i star. Well, what is u i v i star? u i v i star is simply, that's the alarm telling me I should be finishing up soon, u i v i star is simply a matrix where all of the columns in the matrix are given by some weights of ui. Well, what are the weights? Well, the first column of the matrix ui vi star is ui times whatever value you have in the first entry of vi times, and then you multiply by the sigma, and you repeat this. So these are very simple matrices. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this, we refer to these as rank one matrices because the columns are all just duplicates of the same column with some weighting, okay? Fine. Once we have R of those things, we refer to this whole matrix as being rank R. So what is it that we've done in the singular value decomposition? We've taken a matrix, and we've learned from the matrix, okay, a representation of the matrix in terms of these U's and these V's, okay? Interesting. Is it like the problems before? It's very much like the problems before, in that this gives you an optimal decomposition. If someone comes along and they give you some matrix, B, and you ask, what is the optimal way to represent that where I use R different matrices, each of which are of rank 1? Well, the answer is, you compute the singular value decomposition, and then you truncate it at value sigma R. All the values that are after that, you set them to 0. Interesting. So we now have a way of coming up with a representation of the data. And you know, I don't know if you'll use the prior things in your PhD, but the singular value decomposition, it's going to rear its head somewhere. If it hasn't, if it doesn't, something's gone wrong. Somewhere you're going to run into the SVD. Now, the cost of the SVD, this is easier than the dictionary learning problems, but it's nonetheless not brilliant. The standard ways that people do this is proportional to the largest of M or N, and then cubed. Well, that's not very inexpensive. There are ways to try to make it better. There's a lot in randomized numerical linear algebra about how to scale this so that it's not proportional to something cubic in the larger size. Okay, we'll, we'll not worry about that at the moment, and I'm not going to tell you how to compute this, but I do want to give you an example of how this might work. So we're going back to the theater in Edinburgh. Here's the theater 
Here's the approximation to that, where we use 20 rank 1 matrices. Okay? That's a very efficient representation, or it might seem it's very efficient. It's in some ways very efficient. It's only using 20 representations, but those representations you had to learn. And those representations are specific to this matrix. They're not helpful for other images. If you go and you take a picture of this audience, and you use the singular vectors for this image, it's not going to work out well. You need to relearn the representation for every particular image. It has its strengths, it has its drawbacks. Okay, so I said that the singular value decomposition is something that you will surely use in your thesis. It really is something you would use in your thesis. So, how are you going to use it? Well, you are unlikely to use it in such a simple case as someone gives you a matrix and you compute the SVD and you just use it as an approximation of the matrix. And the reason that's probably not how you're going to use it is because the matrix that someone's going to give you is probably going to be more complicated than that. Well, in what way is it going to be complicated? It may be that you don't have all the entries in the matrix. That's very typical. Okay? You might have p values from the matrix. So the matrix is x, it's of rank r, or approximately of rank r. You have p of its entries. I'm going to give the funny notation for what that is. Okay? You need to compute the singular value decomposition, but you don't have all the entries. This is another way of saying, I have a matrix, almost, I have a lot of the entries of the matrix, and I need to fill in the whole matrix, which is the Netflix problem. It's the same kind of problem. Can one do that? Or, in a more complicated way, you could take <coughs> inner products, like we were doing before in the sparse approximation problem, where you take inner products of the matrix against test matrices. Okay? That's called low-rank approximation. And the question we might have is, could we recover the matrix from P of its entries, where P is less than MN? And the answer is yes, but it's more complicated than the problems from before. It's sort of similar to what we were talking about, and the algorithms will look a lot the same. Whenever there's a good algorithm in sparse approximation, there'll be a good algorithm in, in matrix completion, but the analysis will be a little bit trickier. Let me give you a couple of examples, and then we'll look at a, a theorem, and then we'll wrap things up. Here's an example of an image. This is a table at my house, back when I lived in Edinburgh. We're having an Edinburgh theme today. This is what we can get as the recovery from 15% of the entries in that image. Okay. How do we do that? Well, we fill it in by computing the singular value decomposition of a matrix, a whole matrix, which is as consistent as possible with the values that we know, subject to it being low rank. How do we choose the rank? rank? Well, there's theorems behind that. The error is not very large, except where you have things that aren't consistent with low rank. Okay? So it's not fantastic where it's very complicated here, or on this part where it's not diagonal. If you up the amount of samples to be about a third, then the approximation is very good. Okay? Gives you a bit of a sense of where these kind of methods would work. Here's a very quick sketch of how one might analyze such a thing. You might ask questions like, well, do I have enough information that I could conceivably recover the matrix? And the answer would be, well, let's quantify that in some way. I measure some matrix, which is rank R, and I ask, when I measure it by taking P of its entries, for example, do I know that the energy, the size of those sums of those pixels, is not too small and also not too large? And the answer to this is, unfortunately, Yes, you can do this kind of thing, but you have to make sure you don't measure point entries, because this won't make sense in that case. You have to do dense products, and if you want to do point entries, it's even more complicated. We're not going to go into it. Here's an example of an algorithm for how you do the recovery. It's very easy. You take some estimate of what you have. You compute the gradient of minimizing the error between your, your data and the matrix that you think is the correct matrix. And you do what are called line search updates. This is a bit of a plug for what you're going to have in optimization in a few weeks, where you'll learn about algorithms of this sort, called line search algorithms. And if you have certain conditions, you can guarantee that you'll be able to do this problem. 
as the very last, you might imagine that you would have a problem not where you don't have all the data, but where you have all the data, except some of that data has been corrupted. So it could be, for example, that what you have, what you observe, is a, all of a matrix, but it's given by a low rank matrix plus a matrix that has a few entries which are just whatever they are. They're inconsistent with it being a low rank matrix. They could be particular values that someone pathologically chose to try to give you the worst idea possible of what actually the matrix is, or they could just be some noise that was added into the problem. And then you might wonder, could I compute the singular value decomposition of X? Well, not actually the singular value decomposition, the singular value decomposition that I want, the singular value decomposition of R. I actually want to get R out of this. I want to throw away or hide or extract the corruption. Can I do that? And the answer is yes. And here's an example of a, an algorithm that you would solve, subject to that. Sorry, this should be a one here. Um, well, yeah, okay, there's some errors in here. This should be a one, and this should be the sum of the absolute values in the entries in X. And if you solve such a problem, you can prove, and there's theory behind this, that you can actually decompose the matrix that is consistent with this simple model, this low rank model, and the entries which are inconsistent. Okay, and as a last slide, uh, here's an example of how you might use such a thing. So this is some work done by Condes uh, not very many years ago, where you take, for example, video data. So someone gives you video data. Well, what is video data? Well, generically, it's some background which doesn't change very much, and then things that do change. Well, the stuff that doesn't change, if you had a video of the same scene and it never moved, if you were to take that data and make it in a vector for one time frame, all the other time frames would be the same. That would be a rank one matrix. If you have scenes that move, things that move through that scene, then those things that are moving through would just be your sparse component. So for example, here is some scene where people are walking through. Here's the low rank approximation, which is something that needs to be consistent across all frames of the video. And here's whatever was inconsistent with that static background. And it will automatically extract out the features that you're looking for. So here's another example of how you would use a singular value decomposition, but in an environment that's more complicated than what you might normally imagine. All right, and uh, here's a little bit of reading for those of you who are in your first year. All right, thank you.